So, Eve, you've been uh, uh, relatively uh, adamant that some uh, of the science policy discourse in Canada is uh, centered around buzzwords and sort of vacuous terminology and that we really need to start uh, getting a real science policy in Canada uh, going. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yes. You know, the problem that we have in this kind of annual conferences is first that we want to take all the stakeholders together, but when we, we do that, we tend to find the minimum denominator. Okay? So we want to lower the tension, have a consensus where, okay, it's great, and it, finally we agree. Though it's clear that we don't agree. But, we say, but in the end, if I really understand, maybe we, we go in the same direction. So there is this tendency to say, we're nice people, we're so great, we're good. So it's a, a lot of self-congratulation. The problem with self-congratulation is that it's very all good and nice, but you go nowhere with that. If you want a policy, the first thing you need is evidence. Is there something broken? As I said, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Okay? Very often, we import problems. We have heard, for example, that in the States, there will be a lot of problems about uh, integrity of research. Then some people here, who is often in the States, you know, Canadians can easily go in the States, same language, essentially same culture, and they will come back and say, hey, you know, there's a problem. What's the problem? Oh, in the States, you know, they have a law against uh, for integrity of research. And they will start to say, oh, maybe we should do the same. But uh, why? If there is such a thing as a Canadian specificity, it must start on evidence. And I don't think there's a big evidence that we need here the kind of tools about, about uh, research integrity that they created in the States for very specific reason. Because the States is not Canada. Okay? For example, in Canada, we have a specific tool. It's called the Tree Council Policy on Research, uh, on, on research Ethics. But research ethics include, of course, integrity. It's not a different document, it's not a different organization, it's a chapter, and it can be dealt in this way. So if you know the Canadian thing, you start with the Canadian documents, the Canadian history, and then you can learn. Very often, at least at the way I look at it, I see importation of problems that are not always grounded in the Canadian context. Here's an, another example. That there's a lot of talk now about creating an, a kind of say, Canadian Institute of Science Policy. Of course, great idea. But then we can, why, do, why do we need that? It's very important to look at history. In Canada, we had a very important organization called the Science Council of Canada. That has been created around, say, 68. I don't exactly know the year, what, say, 68, maybe 69. Before that, you had the Science Secretariat, 63. And the Science Secretariat was a kind of small organization to think about science policy, but in the ministry. So it was not a uh, arm's length organization. But after three or three years of that, they realized that we needed arm's length organization in, and it came out as the Science Council. Which was doing what? Thinking about the Kenyan problem in science and technology and they published tens of reports on all topics you can imagine. Big science, neutron generator, uh, name it. It's all there. Space, uh, space policy, it existed up to the 1990s when the government at the time, which was a conservative government under Mulroney, said, oh, we have to cut government things. So they cut the Economic Council and they cut the Science Council. So you are about in this in 1993, so in the, in the mid-90s. Now you come 15 years later, how you young people, young PhD, young postdoc, arrive and think, look, there's nothing on science policy. You're right. Why? Because it's been destructed. 15 years ago. So what you want to do, of course, is recreate it. It proves what? Nature abhors vacuum. Thinking science policy cannot be done in vacuum. That was the job of the Economic Council for the economic problems, and the Science Council was the equivalent of the Economic Council. Both were closed. Okay? So now we want to recreate it, but if we forget the reason why it was cut, we won't be able to create one on sure basis. The other thing is that if you want to create one, it's not easy in Canada, because if you want to be at arm's length, 
and not a think tank. If you want to be a think tank, you have a lot of think tanks. You have the Institut Économique de Montréal, which is the francophone copy of the Fraser Right-Wing Institute in, in the West. You have the Conference Board, who is also another think tank paid by a lot of big uh, banks and companies. But if you want to be at arm's length and kind of neutral, the Science Council was a very good organization because it was publicly paid. They were kind of civil servants. So you are sure that it's not necessarily right wing and left wing and the government can accept or not. The report can say, oh, that's a good idea, I'll do it. Or neutron generator, yes. So it's arm's length, it's based on expertise. So in conclusion, every time we think about a problem, we should first ask, okay, what's the evidence for it? Evidence, in, by analogy, in the same sense as in science, before having a big theory, you want the facts. For example, cold fusion. Okay, it, it doesn't work. So we don't start to make a big theory or about how it works. Uh, does it work? It doesn't work. We stop it there. Yeah. Okay, but we tend to forget that in the social sciences, it should be the same. You know, I've been doing sociology of science for 20 years and quite a lot linked to science policy in the large sense, how are university moving, what are the level of investment, what are the number of papers coming out, what are the international collaboration de developing. It's evidence-based. And we know, for example, that if you invest in research, there's a non-linear relationship between input and output, and there are diminishing returns. If it is true that there are diminishing returns, then what's the point of creating a super chair which will get a billion dollar instead of having, say, 20 share at tw with after with you know tw 25 less it's because those people are not yet at the time of of diminishing return so you will get more for the for the same buck but the ideology is to concentrate on supposedly excellence but the thing that excellence is giving a bunch of money to one guy and having effect that's empirically false because after a certain level the guy is to has 24 hours like anybody though he's brilliant will not get output as much as the same money put on a younger one who just happened to be not the biggest shot, but a small shot, and it's a better investment. But this can be measured. You look at the number of dollars per paper, and you realize it goes like that, which makes sense, by the way, okay? You cannot double the money and double the papers. That's crazy. So <laughs> science policy and all the discourse I've listened to very few of them are based on what's the system. There is a system of innovation in Canada. A graduate student has a place in the system. A postdoc has another place. So if you screw up the, the hierarchy, which is linked to salary, for example, an assistant professor should get more than a PhD student, of course. A postdoc should get more than a PhD student. A f uh, associate professor should be better than an assistant professor. But what happened? Now they have created new programs that everyone here finds great. I find it a mistake. They created the Vani Fellowship and the Banting Fellowship. Everyone says, oh, that's great. We give 50,000 bucks for a PhD student. I say, why do we do that? That's absurd. Why? Because in Quebec, it's tax-free. So it means that in practice, those people will get more than an assistant professor. So they rack up the, the ladder of the system. So they don't know that there is a system. They think it's good. They think they will attract the best. That's not true. Why? Because if you go in science, it's not because you want to be rich and famous. You just want to be famous like Einstein. But you, want to be, you don't want to be rich. If you want to be rich, you go in the bank. Okay? Not to, to rub it, but to walk in it. Or rub it also like the people in the financial market has been doing over the last couple of years. But usually you go there. So it's a misunderstanding of the nature of the people who go in science. They want a good laboratory, enough of a salary to leave. See, uh, 35, 40,000, that's much enough for, for a 30, is much enough for a PhD, 45 for postdoc, and 60 for a professor, because professors are not very well paid. So take the postdoc, the famous banting. Those gay people will realize that they will get $70,000 for a postdoc. Two years later, they will drop to 60 as an assistant professor. What, how will they react? He said, 
hey, what's going on here? I'm not well served. I was supposed to the brightest in the world. Now you just give me $60, $60,000. So they have been, they are destructing the logic of a system which was in place since 1916, in which master, PhD, postdoc, professor, it's all in line. And you can create more postdoc with a little, a little bit less and nobody would have complained. I can bet you the money you want that there's never been such an organization of PhD or postdoc who would complain to have more postdoc at 45 than only 130 at $70,000. Okay? I'm only one, I'm, I'm one of the few who says it in such plain words, but I know that most students will say, of course it makes sense to have 1,000 more at 45 instead of, of, of 400 at 70,000. Because they know they will lose money the next year afterwards. So thinking about the realistic science policy is starting from the empirically based understanding of the innovation system of Canada and of course also of the nature of what a scientist is. He's someone who wants a good lab, a good life, but he's not in the game of, oh, I get more money than you, my postdoc is 70, it's a bad thing, you are only a postdoc at 50. This game is good in a financial system where everyone wants to have more money than the other, but it's not a, a good understanding. So wh why they were doing that? They were doing that because they were importing from a, a market vision where the money is the signal. They were importing that to the science system where money is not the signal. The real signal in science is what we call in sociology symbolic capital, meaning credibility. Paper in science, a paper in nature, a paper in physical review, or in, in, for a chemical journal in, a, in whatever it is. That's what people are proud of. Not having 50 bucks more because they published in that journal, but being well received, getting a promotion, then getting a prize from the organization. That's a good understanding of the system, and it should be on this empirical understanding, which is provided by 30 years of research in science, technology, and society, by sociologists of science, to which up to now, science policy makers don't listen because they like buzzwords and they don't really care about the impact of their decision.